The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the Statoil Pressure Vessel Inspection Contest brought to you by Nine Sigma. My name is Jonathan Yakasha from Nine Sigma, and I, along with Kevin Stark, Nine Sigma VP for Technology Solutions, will be your hosts and moderators for this webinar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. The recording and transcription will be made available via the Statoil contest page on Nine Sites. Our agenda for today. I'll begin with introductions for our speakers, and then our panelists will begin discussing the contest. We'll answer your questions during the live Q&A session, and then conclude with a brief summary of the contest information, including where to get more information and a, remember, and a reminder of the submission deadline. As we proceed through the presentation, please feel free to ask questions at any time. We'll track your questions and address them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Moving along, I'll now introduce the panelists from Statoil and from Nine Sigma. From Statoil, we have Richard Sogli, Manager of Innovation, Jan Christensen, Leading Advisor, Static Mechanical Equipment, and Magnar Wute, PhD, Technology Leader, Management. And from Nine Sigma, we have Joost Senens, PhD, Program Manager. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. The purpose of this project, Nine Sigma, on behalf of Statoil, is seeking proposals for inspection technologies capable of evaluating the health of insulated pressure vessels in a non-intrusive manner. Ideally, the proposed solution should be functional without interrupting production or requiring removal of external insulation. Turning now to Richard from Statoil, could you please share with us why Statoil has embraced open innovation? Richard? Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, first of all, I'm sad, just have to say that I'm pretty excited over having the opportunity to run this challenge uh, together with you, and uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of proposals that can help us uh, bring this forward. Statoil has a, a huge R&T organization. We have uh, almost 1,000 employees, mostly in Norway, but also in the US, in Canada, Brazil, and, and China. And uh, since we, we don't care too much about developing the solutions ourselves, we cooperate a lot with other vendors, and that's basically open innovation in practice. So what does open innovation mean to us? Why have we embraced this? Uh, open innovation means, in, in practice, sharing uh, on purpose information we have with others and then capture what others are doing and utilizing that in the best possible way for our projects and operations. And uh, that's in open innovation in general. Then uh, going to this uh, particular contest and challenges, of course, that's more of a subset of open innovation, but that's what we're into now. So, next slide, please, Jonathan. Why do we do this? Uh, the most obvious reason, of course, is that there are so many smart people, even though we have 1,000 people working on technology in general in uh, lots of different areas. Uh, there are so many smart persons outside there that have done a lot of work, uh, millions of them, literally. And, and because people are smart and have a lot of experience in other businesses that we possibly can, can leverage from, R&D in medicine, in material technology, wherever it might be, we can take the opportunity of utilizing that in, uh, in a good way. We don't have to reinvent stuff, and we can accelerate our own innovation. And also, it's uh, a pretty good way running these challenges to test out some assumptions we have. It may be that it's common that is surprising for us. People have some different experiences that can, so then we can uh, have things verified or maybe dismiss some of our uh, hypotheses. Thank you. And then over to uh, the next uh, speaker here, which is uh, then uh, Magnar. Next slide, please, Jonathan. Magnar is uh, within this uh, 1,000 person uh, technology organization. He's a manager for, for production efficiency, as uh, mentioned by Jonathan. So here you go. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Um, I'm a scientist by training, but I've been working several years in operations, in offshore operations. Uh, so I'm really 
proud to to uh, be able to develop and implement new technologies that can benefit us in operations. And the topic of today is uh, one of my top priorities. Um, we aim to uh, to do, uh, not open or enter any of these vessels. Uh, there is a huge one in the in the page in front of you, and so that we can avoid exposing people and also to save all the time and work connected with it. Next, please. This is an uh, overview of a typical uh, separator. It shows uh, a cutaway of a pressure vessel with some internals to help separation of oil, water, sand and gas. These vessels exist in numerous pressure classes and sizes. They may be vertical or horizontal as this one. We may open them and enter by personnel from one or two sides. During inspection, scaffolding might be needed outside and inside. The vessels themselves are made of stainless steel or carbon steel, some with inside corrosion resistant cladding. Outside insulation is also common. Inside, as you can see, there are more or less internals to aid the main functions, that is to separate oil, water, gas and sand uh, from inlet until you have them separated at the other side, at the outlets. The facility, uh, the rig or production ship might, might move. That means it might cause plugging or it not be completely stable during inspection. Deposits are found typically in the bottom or on the surfaces. The inspection is done to reveal cracks or corrosion on the tank shell. Secondary, we are also looking for damages to the internals, which will affect the function. So, uh, with me today, I have uh, two experts that will also uh, help me answering the questions you might have. Uh, experts on material and inspection and uh, how we do this uh, for our offshore and onshore installations. This is also um, a cutaway uh, from the from a pipe or from a vessel. It might be either, and in this case, we have. Uh, also included the insulation to show you that uh, there is some kind of insulation to to keep it hot enough or to protect personnel and it's covered up by a steel mantle uh, in order to avoid uh, uh, damages to the insulation from water for instance. So um, we want to do this inspection preferably with uh, the insulation in place, or we can remove part of it, all of it, uh, and we would like to avoid entering into this uh, contained room. And uh, we are talking about hydrocarbons in most cases, gas and oil. So again, to end uh, my presentation, we want to avoid stop the production. We want to avoid uh, sending people into uh, the vessels and both due to HSC measures and also to increase the efficiency uh, of our production plants. Thank you. All right, thank you Magnar. And now we'll turn to Yos from Nine Sigma who will tell us about the criteria for this innovation contest. Yos? Yes, Jonathan. Uh, I will start to say that all the criteria have been uh, specified in the request document that you can find on the Nine Sides page, uh, Nine Sides contest, contest page. So I hope that you have all read this document. And uh, 
that there you can find a lot of uh, information around uh, what uh, Magna just uh, mentioned and also all the information on how to respond. If you participate and send in a proposal, uh, we should you should try to be as, as compelling as possible in terms of the performance of the solution that you have in mind. The slides here show some of the points that we want you to address in your proposal. So we would like next to the description of your technology also give you some information on who you are, your team experience, maybe some examples of similar installations that you have uh, done tests on, and even a business model, uh, including uh, an overview of how the system is run. Next slide, please. Uh, for possible solutions, the field is open. Uh, so uh, I forgot to say that Statoil is also uh, able, uh, open to accept approaches that do not yet fulfill all the criteria that are all, and that are only answering a part of the stated inspection problem. Uh, on this slide, you see the timeline of the contest. So you see that uh, the contest has been live since April 28. So it's about six weeks now that it is live. Very important is the date of closure. Uh, the closure of the uh, contest will be on July 12, 2016. So at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, that's the time that's applicable in Cleveland, Ohio, the website will close for all participants. So my advice is that you do not wait until the 12th of July to submit your proposal. Try to submit your proposal a few days before this deadline and to avoid running into problems. For example, your internet connection could be bad or too many people are trying to enter the website. In case you have problems uh, submitting a proposal, we can always help you. And my colleagues at the help desk in Cleveland are a great resource for this. But again, a strong advice, do not wait until the last day. If you have a proposal in mind, do it a few days before. Uh, the evaluation of the proposals will take place during the summer. And by end of August, beginning of September, uh, the Statoil team hopes, hopes to have selected uh, the, the best proposals that will go into a final and then during September uh, this will take place and then hopefully three winners will be announced end of September. So another next slide please. Yes, could you tell us why our solution, pro solution providers should be interested in this particular project? Yes, so there are several opportunities. Uh, the first opportunity is a contest award uh, itself. So Statoil is prepared to award three times $15,000 uh, uh, cash prices for the best three proposals that they receive. Next to that, uh, Statoil is also intending to negotiate at their discretion further R&D grants to, to develop promising technology that is not yet fully ready for practical implementation. They will also help you by allowing pilot trials at their test facilities and even do trials on uh, real vessels on their operating sites. The final goal is, however, to find solutions that can be implemented in the Statoil production site, and that the, therefore represents a longer-term business opportunity for those who participate. Next slide. Please. Very good. Thank you. And now it's time for frequently asked questions. These are questions that have been asked in the contest forum uh, via the provider help desk here at Nine Sigma or just our general questions that come up with other Nine Sigma projects. First off, what about intellectual property, IP, and how am I protected? Yost, perhaps you can answer that? Yes, I can answer that. Uh, you are protected because we do not want you to submit anything that is confidential. If you send in a proposal, you should focus on what you can measure, show test data that you generated, discuss an argument what you hope to achieve, but you do not reveal confidential information. For example, you should not say exactly how you set up your measurement system, or you should not mention the exact specifications of all the sensors that you want to use. So that's the way you be assured that you are not giving away your intellectual property. Also, we do not take any IP from you. You keep the IP in your own hands. In the case that Satoral is interested in your technology, you then negotiate these IP. IP rights directly with Statoil. So by participating, you do not give away any of these rights. However, when you are awarded the cash prize, we also expect 
that you agree to execute a non-disclosure agreement so that all intellectual property can be discussed uh, between you and Stato. Another uh, advice, all these details can be found in the contest terms and conditions that are posted on the Stato inspection contest website. It's a document of about seven pages and I advise also all of you to read this document carefully. If you have questions or doubts, forward an email to me or post a message on the forum and we will do our best to answer you as soon as possible. Next okay, slide. and one, uh, one additional frequently asked question, what's the best way to, to respond to this project? Okay, so the best way to respond is to first register on, on our website. So you should have a, an account on, uh, on our Nine Sites website. If you have that, done that, then you can go to the online proposal template. You can fill that in uh, with all the information you want to share, and you can also upload additional information as attachments. So you can add uh, maybe an article that you think is interesting, or some slides with some pictures, uh, anything you think that will help you to get the interest of Stato. Uh, if you have problems doing that, or you have questions, we are here to help you. Very good, thank you, Jos. And now we'll turn to the questions submitted from our audience. Please continue to submit your questions through the Q&A chat box. This is an excellent opportunity for you to pose your questions directly to Stato L personnel. We'll take the rest of our time today to answer them live. If, however, we don't get to your question, don't worry. Our Q&A session is being archived, and all questions and answers will be made available on the contest site. Kevin, could you please present the first question? Sure. So there's a couple of uh, uh, system-level questions I'd like to throw out and ask Yost to address. So the first couple relate to what guidance you can give on this length. And also, if I have my entire proposal as a task, as, as a separate task, is that also the Kevin, okay, can you repeat it? Because I didn't hear you properly. Sorry, I'll break them up. So the first one yeah. is guidance have on how long the submission should be. Okay, okay. So a submission should not be too, too long. So uh, typically we would like... Uh, the other, let's say that the guide, the template that we put on our website is already a guidance, so you should fill in uh, that uh, as concise as possible. So try to summarize everything that you want to add. Uh, typically people uh, have asked that question also for other projects, so I would say if, you're, if you can describe your uh, proposal in, uh, let's say, five pages, that should be, uh, should be sufficient. And as I already said, you can add uh, articles or other information as separate attachments. But the, the key summary of what you want to do should be, uh, let's say, fit into a five to six page uh, document if you would print it out. Is that a good answer, Kevin? Well, yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, there's a clear process related question. If I have a solution that is comprised of different technologies, uh, should I combine that into one response, or is it better to submit as separate responses? Uh, if these technologies are very different and do not, let's say, build on each other, then it's maybe best to submit two proposals, I would say, but if, if you can uh, let's say uh, s submit a proposal and and let's say some of your technologies have common th uh, use common uh, tools then maybe you could uh, you could uh, do it in one proposal and then say approach A is going like this and approach B is going in this, this direction but uh, Great. If you have such a question, you can always uh, send a proposal you have to me, and I can give you guidance if, if needed on the final proposal itself. Great. We're getting a couple of questions related to more information about the insulation. Um, so the first one, and maybe Magnar, you could take this. Uh, can you give more information about what what 
type of insulation there is or, or what kinds of materials are used for insulation? Yes, um, uh, I, I would say uh, we have specifications for a lot of different uh, ways to insulate uh, the vessels. Um, it's general mineral wool, uh, packed as plates and then uh, strapped onto the to the vessel, and then covered with a protective sheet or upper steel. Then. Okay. And and there's one other question related to that. Is it possible, in order to do the inspection, to remove? part of the insulation, um, and, and it really goes to this question of what is, how would you define non-destructive testing? What, what's reasonable to accommodate a technology versus not reasonable? Uh, I, I would start with uh, saying that uh, you, you may remove those, uh, that insulation by sections. Sometimes we have installed uh, inspection uh, the part of the vessel where you can remove the insulation to do kind of thermography, critical parts. Um, so that is possible or we can plan for it and make that if it's something you want to install uh, permanently. So but non, uh, non-intrusive means uh, in general that you will not have to open it up uh, uh, free from gas and hydrocarbons and then uh, have people to enter it. Would you like to add something about that, John? Just to, I have John with me, the leading advisor on static mechanics. Yeah, well, of course, issues when we have uh, several uh, reasons why we put this insulation in. in. It's sometimes for uh, heat conservation, but often it's also for fire protection. And then we don't want to remove uh, much of it during our production because then 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 we are not in a safe operating mode. So so some of it is possible. We are looking also for methods that are easy to remove some of these uh, insulation because it's very costly to remove large part of it. And we always combine is it is it easier to remove the uh, insulation and the, the the stainless steel mantling compared to do an uh, a full stop and open and entering, and we see that in, all, in, in for large vessels there are we use uh, several hundred hours for, for removing uh, this insulation and, and putting it back in operation. So, so if we don't have to, do it, we see it's a very beneficial. It's a very valid point, and uh, it's it's a very practical approach also since cannot remove all the insulation in full production, and but you can remove part of it and compensate by having some extra fire water available or avoiding hot hot work. Uh, so, so there are several approaches to how we can do this more efficient or create access to other methods or yes. Great, and we have a couple questions related to, can, can you comment on what types of technologies you have in place today or you've attempted? I think I, I would maybe introduce uh, Roger Larsen, our um, specialist on uh, materials and inspection methods. Would you like to answer that? Yes, can you hear me? So, yeah. Yeah, you're coming. Uh, my, my name is uh, Roger Larsen, working in material inspection department. So, um, I have a 20 years experience as an inspector on offshore. So normally, um, uh, NDT is used uh, based on um, ultrasonic radiographic, and most of the internal will be used on um, visual inspections. So we are looking for, uh, we have also tried um, the non-intrusive inspections uh, with scanning. And um, this is the uh, most uh, common um, 
or the NDT have been the most common uh, solution as choice. Okay, great. And then maybe yes, a build uh, on that. I think they mentioned it, but the uh, NDT is non destructive testing. Right. Mm. So you mentioned ultrasonic and radiographic. Does that mean that you're still interested in solutions that would incorporate those technologies? Yes, we are. Um, uh, there have been some development of uh, special ultrasonic uh, starting to use the phase array. Also, uh, TUFT scanning is often used. So. Um, and also digital radiographic, but still we need some more improvements. And uh, it's Magna. I would I would just like to add to support that. Um, we we do have techniques, of course, but um, to move forward to meet our strategic targets, uh, we will need a toolbox with several techniques. I don't expect us to find. A single solution. So we are interesting, interested in, uh, in different solutions. And um, as you can see from my introduction, there, there are a lot of parameters uh, when it comes to size and material and what we are looking for. So, so I think uh, we are interested in in uh, what new developments of, of so-called known technology and completely new radical ideas. Great. And just to clarify, are there any technologies or techniques that are not of interest, or are you really just wide open to help uh, assemble a toolbox of different uh, uh, techniques? No, we are, we are we are very open uh, on this uh, because we have such high ambitions and tough targets that we we really have to be open-minded. And look what can bring us forward, whether it's small or big uh, leap. Great. Great, thank you. So, so next question is related to what the defects or corrosion looks like. Can you give some some information related to how small defects are that you would be interested in, or? Can you give some quantified information on types of corrosion or, or size of defects? Yeah, okay, I try. <coughs> uh, um, we have a lot of uh, uh, change in design in the last 20 years. So from the start, we use uh, carbon steel. Uh, also, for the onshore plant, we use a lot of carbon steel. So that's this typical uh, local and general corrosion. The last year, we have improved our uh, technical material specification, and uh, we used uh, carbon duplex and uh, 6 mo stainless steel as most of the um, vessels. In this case, we are looking for a non-inspected failure as cracking or mechanical uh, erosions. So all the spectra, specter you have to inspect for. But the easiest is the carbon steel, then we can expect carbon uh, corrosion and also uh, location of this based on the process. And in terms of cracks, do you have any comments on, on size or length of cracks that, you know, what, what's sort of the minimum viable crack that you really need to uh, uh, target with an inspection technique? Well, the um, acceptance criteria is uh, no crack is acceptable acceptable. But um, experience, uh, typically in nozzles, um, we have um, the welded nozzle inside, internal. 
uh, building uh, damage or cracks. And uh, we use uh, some of the cladding, uh, metallic cladding. Uh, also, this is uh, important to uh, have control. But um, yeah, I, I would say uh, based on uh, two millimeters, uh, we have used as a um, requirement for uh, the procedure. Great. I would like to add a comment. Uh, today's practice, what we want to get away from is the, to open and go inside to clean it and do a visual inspection. So, so we need to be at least as good as an internal visual inspection. Okay. Great. There's also a few questions and I know this is uh, for, for people that haven't been to the website, just a reminder uh, the website is Nine Sites. This is Nine Sigma's open innovation site. That's n i n e s i g h t s dot com. And at the top, you'll see a link to innovation contests. And from there, you can click on the Statoil uh, uh, tile and go right to the page. And on that page, if you haven't visited already, there's some information on the page, but there's also a more detailed specs document that you can download. It's about two to three pages and has some of the additional information. Uh, so one of the pieces that's in that document but hasn't come up today and we have a few questions around so maybe we could address it is uh, give some typical thicknesses for the, the, the vessel walls, uh, uh, wall thickness, insulation thickness, and so forth. Can you give some some idea what that typically looks like. Yeah, I think uh, in, in Stata we have a more, we have about two and a half thousand pressure vessels, and of course they have uh, lots of different diameters, different thicknesses. But they are from low pressure to high pressures, and a typical uh, vessel is uh, which we today do an internal visual inspection is has a typical diameter of. Uh, two and a half meters to up to uh, four meters, and wall thicknesses from uh, uh, 10 millimeters and also up to 120 millimeters thick. Mostly carbon steel uh, and uh, also with carbon steel with an uh, internal corrosion resistant layer of about uh, uh, six uh, to 10 millimeter thickness. The, a typical uh, insulation thickness, I would say, is about from uh, 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 25 uh, or maybe 50 millimeters up to 100 millimeter thickness. And the steel mantling is, uh, I think, is about two millimeter thickness. Great. Uh, so one interesting question in terms of balancing competing objectives, uh, there's, there's sort of three different ways that somebody's thinking about how to present their proposal. And can you give some comments on how to balance cost, complexity, and accuracy? And what are you most interested in putting the highest priority on? Oh, that is a good question. Um, we uh, we are known since we have a long tradition for technology development. We are not afraid to go into complex tasks and, uh, and qualification work, but that will take more time. So, uh, and I, I'm sure there are uh, ideas and techniques that we can apply uh, on a sh shorter notice and it might be be less expensive and uh, we require less resources to to develop and test and implement so um, but uh, of course if if there are technologies that significantly could reduce the amount of vessels we have to inspect or the time we need to inspect them and 
it will uh, it will be interesting uh, about if the task is complex and costly. Right. Prioritize uh, these tasks now since it is really important to us. Great. And in terms of technology readiness, we've gotten a question somebody that has a, a purely theoretical approach that hasn't been reduced to practice. Can you give some comments about how important it is for a proposal to include uh, uh, examples of success in the past or do you still want to hear theoretical options for you to consider? I, th I think you have to um, justify that the idea is possible to to develop and realize into something practical, uh, and we have technologies with a technology readiness level from zero to seven, which is our scale. So uh, again, it's, it's back to to whether you can justify that uh, there is some uh, probability that we will exceed uh, at the end. Okay. If, if there is a brand new ID which is very immature, it's, it's smart enough, we would we'll go for that. Uh, but it it's all depends on the ID, definitely. Mm. Okay. From a technology standpoint, one question is whether you've tried pulsed eddy current techniques, and, and if you have, uh, uh, do you have any comments about the effectiveness of that? Okay. Yeah, hello, uh, Roger Larsen. Uh, yeah, we have used uh, eddy current for different, uh, most of, uh, we have used the RFT for um, a heat exchangers, the bundle. But we uh, often use the eddy current for crack detection. So, it uh, compares to uh, magnetic particle inspection and penetrance. Okay. So just give me a second. I'm scanning some different questions to figure out what, what's a good one. Um, So, so one question again asked: Can I can I submit two partial solutions? I think we've answered that from the standpoint of we want to give you the maximum flexibility to think about how to present your solution. As Yo said earlier, if they're complementary and make sense to to combine into one proposal, that seems like a good way to do it. If you have two very different approaches, even if they're partial solutions maybe that would be better for you to submit as two separate proposals. Uh, so so you, you mentioned briefly that you have different pressures available. Can you talk about the environments uh, inside the vessels and sort of ranges of, of pressure, atmosphere, how corrosive are they, just to kind of give a sense what, what how difficult or challenging the environment uh, might be for technologies to be deployed. There are a wide spectrum of, uh, of uh, issues. We have from uh, seawater that are not very, uh, uh, not quite uh, difficult, and to uh, produced water that are seawater with some gas and oil in, to the full uh, oil production who has. Uh, uh, raw oil and water and uh, gas, and also completely gas, uh, hydrocarbon gas uh, uh, vessels and uh, towers, and uh, they are uh, in an explosive atmosphere inside the vessels. Uh, and uh, we, we need to be very precautious what, what we do put inside this one. But we have uh, all right. kind of vessels. Pressures are high from uh, uh, atmospheric to, to up to 100 and also 150 to 200 bars. But the, the most are within the uh, uh, range from uh, 10 to uh, 80 bars. That's typical. Great. 
temperature of uh, of uh, under operation is from uh, uh, there any grades from uh, a few degree uh, uh, Celsius and up to uh, 100 degrees or uh, also above 100 degrees. It's not very difficult. And uh, some uh, of the vessels include uh, uh, different chemicals that we don't want to be exposed for. for uh, and also H2S is issues we have, and they are corrosive, and we try to protect our uh, from this environment, from the carbon steel itself. And of course, this is also the issue we want to inspect, and we want to make sure that this uh, uh, corrosive media doesn't uh, come into our uh, uh, steel uh, and then uh, make a, a risk of uh, of cracking and uh, this is issues that we focus on. Great, that covered a lot of really interesting specs. We even had a, a question about temperature, so you addressed that one as well. Thank you. Um, I think one of the other interesting questions we have is, can you give a sense of of what type of implementation you're most interested in. So for example, is this, do you envision a permanent solution being, being bolted on or inside the vessel at all times, constantly monitoring, and therefore uh, uh, the, the instrumentation to get the information out is required at all times? Or is this more of a spot check that at certain intervals, maybe every month, you'd want to go do an inspection and then pull it out and, and collect the data offline? Um, I think I, I would prefer something easy that we could just uh, scan over uh, the separator. Um, uh, which would influence on instrumentation or people working around. Uh, but we do have sometimes uh, instruments or methods where we can uh, kind of observe uh, a damage, some corrosion or something that has happened to, to a pipe or, or a vessel. But uh, so far my experience is that uh, it, uh, it requires maintenance and it requires a lot of data transfer, follow up from the personnel. So, so something permanent uh, might not be the first choice, uh, particularly if you have to place it inside a vessel, because then you have to go in there to inspect that again. So, um, but anything from, from the outside, even though you have to place it there, but it needs to be non-EX and it shouldn't be radioactive sources, at least uh, should be kept below a certain level. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's good. Thank you. Um, so, so one question, and maybe we'll have to take this offline, but there was a question about is there a way to provide a cross-sectional overview of the separator to kind of get a sense of what those internal obstacles look like? Um, we'll try to take it offline, but I just want to throw that out to, to see if we can work that one. Um, let's so see I here. Didn't quite, I didn't quite get the question. Oh, the question was, yeah, I, there's a couple questions where, so the, the figure that we've shown is one example of what a pressure vessel can look like and what the contents are inside. And that's a side view, and one of the questions was, is there a cross section to actually look like what each of those sections look like to understand the, the mechanics and the obstacles inside the, the vessel? Yes, uh, we do have a lot of different uh, drawings. I can't say that uh, they are general because some of the vessels might be quite empty, so you can easily access them from a nozzle or from the manhole by a person or uh, an instrument. Others are quite crowded, like the one I showed before, uh, where you can pass from one section to the other without removing 
certain parts of it. So, uh, but uh, all all vessels are documented with general arrangement point, and and they are quite different. Okay. Also like to, I also like to add that uh, if you, the, the typical fixture uh, we have on a separator, it also shows how difficult it is to go inside to remove all parts to get access to to the wall to check it for the wall thicknesses. So, so it, it is also selling a, what are the issues we have and why we use had to spend so much time to do a proper inspection also from internal. But, um, and I could add that it is not, even though it might look like it's uh, to complete cross section is filled up, there are usually some air gaps in the bottom or, or, or something that you can pass a wire or something below or above. Or you can make it without uh, interfering with the general function of, of the vessel, if that helps. Great, and we talked a lot about the inside of the vessel. There's one question about what the outside environment looks like. Uh, uh, and again, you've talked about that you have about two and a half thousand of these, so I'm sure there's a wide range. Can you talk about the outside environment? Are a lot of these exposed to the sun? Are there various uh, temperature and humidity ranges that you can comment on? We have a, a lot of these vessels are on our oil and oil oil and gas platforms in the North Sea, so they are exposed to uh, to the sea uh, and uh, they are quite open. From a, we we try to keep an open environment from uh, so there are uh, sea and atmosphere. There are uh, temperatures like you have in all the areas around. They are exposed to sea. Uh, water splashing in and rain and everything. It's quite compact uh, around and we try to make this area quite small to save weight of course. So, so they are quite tight around them with the uh, kind of uh, all other kind of piping and uh, so, so there could be limited access around. Some, sometimes we have good access as well but it, it depends. Great. And then just a clarifying question. We talked earlier about the internal corrosion coating being about 3 to 10 millimeters. Are there typical, is, is that an epoxy? Are there typical con uh, concentrations? Is there anything else you can comment on about, about that coating? Uh, that is sometimes we have used uh, coating. That's, uh, uh, but uh, often also is a met metallic coating, uh, not a metallic coating, but it's a, it's a welded on with a stainless steel or a corrosion resistance uh, layer. And the coating is, is uh, paint-like. We have a few with some rubber uh, lining, but it, it's mostly like it's a kind of a painting type or these uh, corrosion resistant metallic uh, layers. Okay. And in terms of, so that's interesting, you mentioned metallic, uh, it could be metallic on the inside because um, we did have a question just understanding what the surface looked like. Somebody was asking about, about uh, uh, like a magnetic robot wheels to, to, to roll on the inside. So it sounds, again, what we're talking about is a lot of variety, a wide variety of types of vessels different coating, different thicknesses, different temperatures, pressures, sizes, and so forth. Um, another question about, about a possible technology. Have you already tried total focusing method from ultrasonic phase arrays? Uh, and if so, do you, do, you see, do you think that that's an applicable approach or not? Hello, uh, Dorit Klaassen. Uh, yes, uh, last five years we have uh, tried the phase array most uh, externally for nozzles, uh, flange, and difficult uh, geometric. But um, it's uh, still under development, I think. 
so it's uh, also um, you need a good um, operate operator to do the methods and it need the calibration but uh, I, we have a lot of improvement uh, for modeling uh, scanning and uh, I think it uh, will be more used okay okay we, we're, we're um, in the last 10 minutes so I just want to call out that we're going to try to pull maybe a couple more final questions and then move to wrap up so if you have a final burning question for us to try to fit in uh, please go to the chat box and, and post that uh, quickly uh, let's see So, so I think one interesting element um, that maybe we didn't touch on is um, if somebody has solutions for new pressure vessels, uh, is that of interest or are you really looking exclusively for retrofitting and solutions for existing installations? We, we are constantly uh, uh, replacing and also uh, building new uh, platforms and plants, so uh, we look at what we need to, to do and see if we can do something in the design or, or, uh, or, or the fabrication phase uh, that would help us during we have a long lifetime, they will stand up for 25 or up to 50 years sometimes, so everything we can do in the start will be very beneficial for us. Great. And I think the last one, there was a question related to, we talked a little bit about cracks uh, is, and, and possible sizes. Is there any comment you can make on the orientation of those cracks? Are they uh, 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 along the length of the, of the vessel? Is there any other information you can give about those type of defects when you find them? Yeah, we we are looking for uh, a, a critical cracks that can uh, that that are critical for the vessels. So so we are looking for something that uh, could uh, do something about the integrity of the vessel itself. Uh, and for typical uh, uh, pressure vessels, uh, we, we we don't accept uh, accept any cracks at all when we have high pressures. So but the, the, the most for a typical pressure vessel is the longitudinal cracks. Uh, are, are, are more critical than the opposite because of the of the, the design of the vessel and what the, the resulting f uh, forces of uh, an internal pressure that uh, we look they are as uh, critical both of them are very critical and and, and we need to to have a full uh, control of both of them Great. Well, thanks for all the questions. We've really gotten a nice variety. It's been a great discussion. Again, uh, this, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll be posting the link later. You'll be able to listen to that, and we'll be transcribing this as well as making sure that, that the entire Q&A is built out in a separate document. So if we didn't get to your question, uh, we'll try to address that offline. If, and then, of course, Q&A doesn't stop today. You can certainly post on the forum, email the help desk, and we'll see how to uh, get you an answer as quickly as possible. Uh, so with that, thanks. Let me turn it back over to Jonathan to help wrap up. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you to the Statoil team. Thank you, Yos. So for our attendees today, what can you do today? First off, obviously, you can visit Nine Sites to learn more about this particular contest. You see the URL right there on your screen. As Kevin mentioned previously, you can navigate to Nine Sites and select Innovation Contests, and from there you can select the Statoil Contest, and that'll take you to more information about the project. Once you're on the project page, you can subscribe to the forum, which will keep you upda updated when new questions come in and when those new answers are provided. You can view the frequently asked questions. You can also, via the Solution Provider Help Desk, at phd at ninesigma.com, and that phone number there in the U.S. The help desk is staffed
pretty frequently to answer your questions as quickly as possible. And when the contest begins to close on that Monday and Tuesday just before the close, we'll have that staffed uh, fully to answer your questions and answer your concerns as quickly as possible. Please keep in mind, right there in red, the submission deadline is July 12th, 2016 at 5 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. So uh, as Yost suggested, please submit your, your proposals as soon as, as soon as you can and well in advance of the submission deadline. You don't want to get caught by any kind of internet outage or computer issue and miss that deadline. So with that, I will conclude today's webinar. For additional information, we encourage you to visit the contest page, register to stay connected in, via the contest forum. And one final note, today's webinar was recorded and will be made available in the coming days. Thank you to our speakers for their time and expertise. Thank you for our attendees. We appreciate your time and we look forward to receiving your submissions. Thanks and have a great day.